So hi everybody, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our interview session for the All That Matters conference. And my name is Greg Pryor. I am a partner at Reed Smith and head our entertainment and media division. I'm based in London. It is my great pleasure to be talking to um, Thomas Hesse. Thomas has uh, a long and illustrious career in the media and in the music industries. Um, he is now the founder and CEO of a new live streaming business called Dream Stage. And so I'm very excited to be able to talk to Thomas today and hopefully get his unique and interesting perspective about what's happening in the marketplace and learn more about his Dream Stage business. So Thomas, uh, welcome and thank you for joining. Thanks for having me, Greg. Good to see you. Um, and you. Well, good to see you virtually, Thomas. Of course, we're not seeing each other in person, sadly, but uh, on the screen, you're looking fit and healthy and relaxed, which is excellent. Um, thank you. I wonder if I might start, Thomas, you know, we came across each other a long time ago when digital music was very much a a pirate activity. I remember that you know, there were small divisions in record labels dealing with this newfangled thing called the internet, and there wasn't really um, much prospect of it turning into a viable business. So, but, but you've had a, a fascinating career. I wonder if you might say a little bit about um, your time in the music industry and how you ended up there. Look, uh, Greg, I joined the music industry when it was really not doing very well. And it was under pressure from piracy. Uh, the Napster lawsuit had been won, but Bearshare, Grokster, and all these other um, companies that were inciting people to steal music and share amongst each other were all over the place. Um, and we we started to see the decline. And it's in that context that we did the merger of Sony and BMG, which I was very much involved in on the Bertelsmann side, um, which was it, which combined these two music companies and allowed us to cut a lot of cost as a buffer against the impending sort of decline in our revenue. And um, at the same time, um, as we saw the physical business decline and not really a good answer in digital um, clearly uh, presenting itself, we went to Cupertino. Uh, this was just weeks before the merge. I think we'd done the agreement already, and we, but we hadn't executed it yet. Um, and we met with Steve Jobs, who said, I have an idea. It's called the iTunes Music Store, because this iPhone, this app, not an iPhone, there's no iPhone, this iPod is full of stolen music. So we should be selling music. Um, I love the music industry. I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan. Um, I'm a huge Bruce Springsteen fan, is what Eddie Q said. He loves, uh, and, uh, and uh, let's get going. And the only condition is you have to license every song at 99 cents and every song individually. And to us, that was obviously, as record companies, a big deal. We did it. We bet on those guys. And that was the beginning of the digital music business. Um, and that was the beginning of a growth curve that then continued, we start with US, then UK, then, you know, videos, uh, other countries, ringtones, etc. And it was the beginning of the digital revolution in the music business and a legitimate digital music business. I remember those days. I remember Eddie Q standing at the first medium net, you know, when medium had a medium net and they, uh, he said, I've done a, a million downloads. And everybody yeah. went, wow, a million downloads. That's a crazy, crazy number. I mean, what was the, what was the mood then? Because I want, to, I want to follow the journey from you know, that period, which I remember very clearly when there was almost zero chance of making a business. And then look where we are now, where you are now founding and running a business that's going to be selling the opportunity to see artists live on stage via the internet. I mean, that's a huge journey. What was the mood like back then in the early 2000s? The mood was pretty gloomy. Um, and I mean, we did the merger. We instantly cut about $300 million of cost, uh, which was duplicative infrastructure in most territories. 
And the company ended up cutting $800 million of overhead, which kind of tells you there was a lot of overhead, but it also tells you how deep the cuts were. And every single year, I was also then responsible for our physical business and the sales and distribution entity for North America. And every year we had to tell people, look, there's just not enough revenue to support this team. And we cut it down every year. The good news was that there was another business that was growing, and that was the download business. Um, the next big step for us was video and turning video, which was always just a cost center. We were producing these expensive music videos to ship them to MTV for them to broadcast them and for us to sell records. And it was a loss leader, but uh, we quickly realized there was demand for that content. Um, and uh, we were able to do an in initial deal with uh, Yahoo and AOL and MTV, which was very lucrative. Andy Lack was still the CEO of, of Sony BMG at the time. Um, and, then, uh, and then we did a deal with a small company called YouTube um, that was still independent. Um, and th they were being sued by Viacom. And we decided, let's not sue them, let's license them. And we did that. We did that deal. Uh, uh, six weeks later, uh, Google bought YouTube. And, um, um, and that was the beginning of the whole music video thing. And for years, you, Google was not very good at monetizing our music videos. So then Doug Morris and Rolf Schmittals uh, had this idea, let's, let's create uh, an entity that puts our music videos into a bright, clean, lit place. We called it Vivo and Sony and Universal. Uh, I was uh, involved and very involved at that time uh, with Zach Horowitz and, um, and the rest of uh, the team to, to bring Vivo together. We were on the board for many years and it's been a, a pretty huge success in raising CPMs and building out the video streaming business uh, with much better economics for the labels. Um, and then the next big thing, Greg, was streaming and subscriptions. And, and looking now, yeah, you know, I remember those days when when YouTube was bought by Google. It seemed like such a revolutionary thing. And a friend of mine was actually general counsel of YouTube at the time. I think looking now at this kind of galactic success of streaming, notwithstanding that you know Rhapsody and Spotify really took a chance at the time by uh, persuading rights holders that. You know, we could give the music away, but ultimately it would act as a funnel for subscription. If I look at this kind of huge popularity of streaming, your background in um, the early days of digital followed by video, Dream Stage feels like the next logical step. But I wonder if you might tell us a little bit about, you know, how Dream Stage came about and how you ended up uh, being in the business. Yeah. So I think, you know, the, the, the recorded business has turned a corner based on, we haven't really talked much about Spotify in that brief overview of the rec recorded industry, but obviously with the iPhone and then, and then Spotify coming in, we all jumped in and, and that's that subscription model and the belief that free would convert into pay actually really worked out. We had seen it in Sweden. We're very glad to have seen it elsewhere. And the record industry has now been in growth mode for, for, for a number of years and, and the projections are amazing. So I think Recorded is great and Recorded has done well through the pandemic. But when the pandemic hit, um, something extraordinary happened. The live business was just completely decimated and completely disrupted. And the live business hasn't really changed ever since digital happened. People go out to a concert, they buy a ticket, um, they have a good time and they go home. They buy a t-shirt, it's sort of a very simple, and business that's been around forever and that hasn't really changed and hasn't really been affected. To some extent, ticketing has and sort of how you sell tickets a little bit, but, but the experience itself hasn't really changed. And that's where, when the pandemic hit, a very good friend of mine, Sony recording artist, Jan Vogler, he's one of the top five cellists in the world. He runs several festivals in Europe. Um, and he and I have been friends ever since, you know, forever anyway, won't get into the details, but he came to me and said, um, he, he ran several streams that were free. And he said, Thomas, the streams are amazing. I'm getting hundreds of thousands of people to watch me and Midori and Joshua Bell and all those guys I got together for New York Never Sleeps. And then he did another one for Yo Yo Ma, for, 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 for the death of Lynn Harrell, including Yo Yo Ma and other cellists and so on. And it's hundreds of thousands of people come. And he says, we should do something 
that's better in quality and that's uh, that's ticketed, that where people pay for. Because the way this is going, these robe concerts with their poor quality uh, being free, that's not the way forward. But musicians are going to starve. Musicians are desperate to perform. This is huge business. And then we found um, a, a technologist who's incredible, Scott Chasen, who's our third founding partner, who had just come off uh, selling his company ProtectWise to Verizon and who had previously sold his company to McAfee, where he had another company where he was uh, the CTO and, and, and really a serial entrepreneur of in, impeccable pedigree and incredible intelligence. And, um, and uh, he brought about 20 engineers in, um, many of whom worked for us for free because they were uh, you know, loyal to, to Scott and, and believed in him and what he had built in the past and believed in the idea and believed in the opportunity. Um, and uh, with that background, we're able to very quickly build DreamStage. DreamStage is a ticketed a platform for live music performances that is all about quality, that is all about premium, that is all about giving the artist access to the data, that is all about creating something beautiful, high-end, um, and specific to artists and the music industry. And we've built that in record time. Um, and we're very, very excited about the future. Yeah, I mean, we had a conversation about DreamStage only months ago, and, and you know, already you're up, up and running, and you know, we're a really illustrious, uh, experienced founder team, if I may say. Um, how does it work for the artist? I mean, clearly, you, you're right, the pandemic has had a devastating effect on, on the live industries. You know, some really sobering statistics that we see in the marketplace about, you know, and, and not the most promising outlook in terms of, you know, the uh, pandemic uh, loosening its grip on the industry anytime soon. Uh, clearly, one of the things that's attracting um, you and likely others to this space is the ability to hit an audience that's limitless. And one of the natural constraints of a live performance is you know, yes, you can be there at a time and say, well, I saw this band in this venue on this date, but there, there is this natural audience constraint. Has it, has it worked for the artist if I'm going to appear on Dream Stage? Not that I would, by the way, because I'm a terrible artist. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So just to maybe take a step uh, back one second, it's a 30 billion industry that this year is going to be like seven and a half or something like that. So there's like a huge gap this year. I think next year we could see, we will see the gap continue um, and maybe for it to pick up back to something closer to normal in the, in the last quarter or, or half of it. So I think next year, again, we'll see uh, something like seven to 8 billion. So we're basically saying, 60 billion has gone to 16 billion over the course of the, the, these two years. This is a over $40 billion revenue gap that's just not there anymore. And that's looking for an outlet. And it's an expression of how much the artists are hurting from not being able to perform, how much the managers and the agents and everybody else who's in their wake are hurting. And it's, a, it's an expression of how consumers, fans are really missing the opportunity. And we've seen streaming um, sort of come in into the second quarter, 140 million Americans started streaming live music, which is a, a staggering number. And we've seen the weekly music consumption of streaming explode to the, to the point where live music streaming is now 12% of all music consumption, which is just one point less than radio a business that was almost inexistent or very, very uh, small a year ago. And everybody, you know, a vast majority of people say they enjoy it and they'd like to do more. And what we've seen is that the artists went after this, they built their social presence, but they've also now realized they need to go for quality and they need to go for revenue. So what we've now seen is that um, ticketed live streams have started to pick up. And we've seen the Koreans, as in so many other areas, um, so it's great to be in Asia to talk about this, but the Koreans and their incredible fan base have been leading the way. The biggest one everyone knows about is BTS that sold literally 756,000 tickets at an average price of between 26 and 35 to make about $20 million from that 
one concert. Even smaller Korean bands like Super M, 75,000 sold tickets uh, at an average price of 30. Um, Monster X, 31,000 tickets. And then we've seen sort of some of the Western artists getting into this. Trivium are uh, selling 12,000 tickets. Joe Bonamassa, 16,000 tickets. So we're seeing that the numbers are coming up and that artists are starting to use this art form. Um, and artists are announcing, artists are getting their fans to come. I think the critical thing for this to work, and we've seen this with BTS as well, is not to have a robe concert from the home, but to make a real effort, make this into an event, um, find a sound stage, a studio, or literally you could be in any location, but a location that makes a difference. And that is interesting, um, magical, uh, beautiful for the fans to look at, uh, get together as a band, get some amazing audio, amazing video. And then I think our experience is that you can mobilize between 0.5 and 2.5% of your social reach. Depends very heavily what genre you're in, um, but you can really mobilize a big audience. Um, and I think the better the platform um, and the better your marketing and the closer your relationship with your fans and the more beautiful the production and the more you turn it into an event, the more likely it will be that it will be something very special um, and that the fans will show up. You have to turn this, these uh, paid streaming experiences into can't miss events for the fans. If you do that, I think you'll, you can be very, very successful. And in, in some ways, the funny thing here, Greg, is we're back to appointment TV. Everybody's going to Netflix, nobody's watching TV at any specific time. But I think what we're building here is a new format, a new format for live music that uh, people will go to um, um, that is um, a little bit substitutional maybe for the long term, but mostly incremental as people will go back to live concerts. Yeah, it's a really interesting observation you make there. You know, when you think about the parallels and the, and the television broadcast industry struggling to deal with the kind of um, on-demand explosion and yet sport, you know, as a parallel where you could say, hey, I, I, there's only one time I can watch that. And so, exactly. you know, you, you, you very expertly outlined the opportunity, which seems to be huge. And, and, and even though it's driven by, I guess, necessity in many ways, there seems to be a clear gravitational pull towards that live streaming. I, I noticed in fact, the numbers were, were dramatically increasing even before the pandemic. And some people are saying that in fact, the pandemic's just had an accelerative effect on a phenomenon that was kind of already building and momentum was growing. Um, yes. You know, looking forward for the next kind of six to 12 months and perhaps beyond with Dream Stage, what do you see as some of the, start perhaps with the challenges, I think we see the opportunity and then perhaps you know, what do you think the competition is going to be doing and, and, you know, what happens when live does come back? Exactly. I think the pandemic has been a catalyst for this. It's not dissimilar to us being on this Zoom call. Uh, I've been on Zoom for several years now uh, working with startups, um, but many people didn't know about Zoom and I've been on boards where they constantly said, oh, we've got to get there in person. And I've been traveling to Europe and back to, to go to these board meetings. But now no one even talks about that anymore. So I think, and I don't think these board meetings will ever return in person because it's so convenient to just have everybody on a, on a, on, on a Zoom. Uh, some will, and I do think that there's a, an important place for in-person meetings, but I think it'll, it'll, it will be reduced. I think for artists in some ways, the whole environment situation, uh, the whole crisis, um, many of the artists are above 60 um, that are big touring artists. You know, they've been traveling like crazy. My friend Jan said he would go to Asia and then he would zip back to New York and he'd go to Europe and zip back to Latin America. And this whole crisscrossing of the world, he feels is not gonna come back the way it was. And I think consumers have learned or are learning, and this is our unique opportunity now, I think we're still at the very, very early stages of this, that 
you can have a pretty amazing experience. And we're just introducing a feature called Watch Party to Dream Stage, where you'll be able to watch with your friends, almost like having a personal concert, having those famous bands play in a setting where you and your friends from around the world can chat, potentially see each other. There's many other aspects of making this interaction with the fan and the artist, making it, finding digital um, replacements for uh, what happens or digital enhancements, let's say, for the experience. So it becomes richer and richer. It'll never be the same as a live concert. I would never ever say anything like that. So people will go back to live concerts once we have the vaccine and those will be thriving again. However, maybe the artist doesn't go on tour every single year, but every other year they'll just say, I'll do two or three uh, dream stage concerts. And maybe the audience will go to more live events, but they won't go to more live events in person. They'll still go to as many as they did before, but maybe they'll go to as many uh, uh, watching it in the comfort of their home on their big screen with the big you know, surround sound system with a few friends and a cocktail in their hand and just enjoying the richness of that, uh, just like they're watching baseball on TV and they're still going to baseball games. So I think it's, it's an incremental thing. It's a new format, the richness of which we haven't even scratched the surface. Many people will say, oh, can we do a concert? I'll rent Madison Square Garden. We can get, don't rent Madison Square Garden. You don't need Madison Square Garden. Get a big sound stage, but get a huge LCD screen behind you and do something amazing on that LCD screen. You can perform on the surface of Mars. And next thing you know, you're somewhere else and you create something that's more akin and coming out of Vivo and the whole music video background, something that's sort of a mixture between a live event and a music video where the richness of the digital effects and all the things you could do in the background and still be live and say, by the way, Greg, great to see you. Thank you for bringing 20 friends to your watch party. I'm so excited that you're here. And you hear that and you're live and there is that live connection, which can be very, very powerful. So what I'm saying is we only at the beginning of building a new format, one that I think will be incremental, one that will be exciting, one that will expand sort of what live is and, and build a, a strong market, uh, both for artists who can make a lot of money there and not travel and do something beautiful and for fans who can connect with their, the artists they love in a very uh, exciting way. Right, it's so, it's so interesting you say that when I think about you know, just before the pandemic, I think Coldplay came and said, hey, we're not going to be traveling for our tour. We want to be environmentally friendly. And then when you look at the, um, you know, the technological opportunities, I agree with you. Just beginning, when you look at um, what Travis Scott did with Fortnite, when you look at one of our clients, um, Cascade, did a, did a stream from way above the Grand Canyon on the big platform. Um, all kinds of super interesting things happening. And that's not even to talk about some of the additional revenue opportunities that I think are going to be associated with that. I guess yeah. look, it's really fascinating to hear you talk about this because, you know, with your background, I think you're better placed than many people to um, see the broader environment within which live streaming would sit. I guess my final question, because we're, we're, you know, we're close to the end of our time slot, um, where does this, you know, perhaps a, a slightly left field question, where does this leave the labels? You know, when you think about, you know, as a, as a label, ex-label person yourself, you know, they've got this recorded opportunity, but not necessarily, you know, are we going to go back to 360 deals? How, how, do you th how do you see that evolving or would it just be complementary? Look, I think it depends uh, on the region, it depends on the artist, and it depends on the labels. Um, in regions, particularly in Asia, where the labels have a lot of 360 deals and have artists under contract, um, including live, um, mm. I think they can play a big role in this world. Mm. Um, in any case, I do think it's nice to record the concert and make it available to the fans after the fact. We don't do that yet, uh, but we would love to do that. Um, and that, in, that obviously then involves a recorded music right. So I think the labels will have a very important role to play in this. Um, and we, we are talking to them and we'd love to work with them uh, in many ways. I think it's a, 
it's a great opportunity for the labels to even get involved a little bit in the life business that traditionally hasn't really been there. So in, in some ways, the discontinuity creates opportunity, I think, for many. Um, and certainly those that have the rights for everything will, will get very involved in this. Um, yeah, yeah, and we'd yeah. have to work with them. We're a platform. We've built, I think, uh, an amazing platform. And, and we have patents now that we've that we've uh, a patents pending that we that we're very excited about. Um, we will go down this path and build more and more functionality. I think that's what startups are best at: building amazing technology, building amazing platforms. Incumbents, I think, are always a little slow and maybe uh, uh, not as well suited for that kind of innovation. But the labels and all their rights, I think, will be amazing partners for us. We really look forward to speaking to them more about all this as the market um, develops. So, so Thomas, look, it's always a pleasure to speak to you. And I, I want to say thank you on behalf of the All That Matters team for being so generous with your time. It's a great um, pleasure to speak to you. And we wish you all the very best with your with your venture, we think it's going to be a great success. So thank you for joining thank us. Thank you, Greg. Great to see you. Thank you.